I want to tell you a story that changed my life. But before we get to that, did you know that Vancouver doesn't have a tagline? You know, like a, like a theme, a catchphrase, like, you know, there's like Rose City or the Emerald City or, uh, uh, you know, the Big Apple and something. And I looked on the website for Vancouver, and apparently our tagline is USA, which means, <laughs> which is really like Vancouver, no, the other one. Um, and I, maybe you've had that in a conversation with somebody when you've traveled or said where you live. Uh, and you can't have an identity that's in direct opposition of something else. That's not an identity. Look, and I know Portland's right across the bridge and stuff, but we can't just go, oh, Vancouver, yeah, I can afford that. Um, or, uh, you know, Vancouver, the Portland traffic made me do it. Uh, I mean, why don't we just, then we're just going to get desperate and we're going to be like, Vancouver, um, did you know we have a Chick-fil-A? Um, so, you know, so like the city's growing, they're building the waterfront, there's going to be a lot of changes and stuff. And so how do we become, what does it mean to become a community and how is our identity formed? I want to share with you a story that a friend of mine shared with me, and it takes place in Tacoma, Washington, which is, yes, which is the city of destiny, which is the best name ever, but we can't steal that one. Um, and this, my friend is named Joan. Um, she's a delightful septuagenarian who uh, has a twinkle in her eye and a great smile. Uh, she spent her life being a nurse and an end-of-life caregiver, and then when she retired, she became an artist, which is how I met her. Um, and she shared this story with me that I want to share with you. So Joan uh, grew up in Tacoma, but her family, when she was very young, moved from St. Louis, Missouri to Tacoma. And then Joan experienced a real tragedy when her mom died unexpectedly at a young age. And after a time of grieving, her working dad, with no help of any relatives around, needed to find somebody to take care of her and her brother. And thus began a series of young African-American nannies that entered into Joan's life. It's an important to note here that Joan didn't grow up in a family that was fond of the African-American community. Like Joan told me that her dad was very bigoted towards black men and women. But because of their financial state and be be because that uh, African-American nannies were a lot cheaper than white nannies, uh, this became uh, like a series of black women who were in Joan's life as a caretaker. And look, Joan and her brother didn't care what the skin color was of their nannies. They just knew that it wasn't their mom. And, uh, and, and, they, and that person could never fill their shoes. And so a way that only children are particularly um, gifted at doing, they just decided to be the little shits they could to either like make them go insane or run away or whatever came first, right? And so, and they were really successful at it until this one woman came in their lives who they didn't want to get rid of. She was wonderful. She said she had an amazing smile and a beautiful voice, and they loved her dearly. And Joan said that this time with this woman changed her life, like filled her with something that was lacking in her life. Later on, Joan grows up. She goes to college. She decides to become a nurse. And so she's in Tacoma going to nursing school. This is about the time, like a year before Martin Luther King was assassinated. And Joan finds out, while she's at a friend's apartment, she finds out that there's actually going to be a civil rights march down in Tacoma. And when Joan hears this, she's like, oh, we got to go. And she's with, at a friend's apartment, all of them are white. And her friends are like, no, 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 we're not going to go down. That's not our thing. And Joan's like, no, no, we have to go down. And they're like, you can go down if you want to. And Joan's boyfriend was there too. And as she, she said as she was walking towards the door, her boyfriend came after her and was like, hey, if you go down there, when you come back, I'm not going to be here and we're not going to be together any longer. And Joan's like, okay, I'm going. And in fact, when Joan's dad found out that she went to this march, um, he wouldn't let her in the house for two weeks. So Joan goes down to this march and uh, a lot is changing. You know, all stories of transformation, all stories of transformation are about something ending so that something new can come out, right? That's why we should talk about butterflies. Guys, do you know how butterflies are made? I mean, you're a pretty educated crowd, so I think you have a fairly good idea, right? Like there's a caterpillar and he's like, I'm hungry. So this caterpillar like eats a bunch of leaves and then he's like, I'm tired. And so then he makes a chrysalis and he gets inside and takes a long nap. And then after a certain amount of time, he comes out and he's like, I'm fabulous. And then he's a butterfly, <laughs> right? And that's pretty much the scientific definition of how butterflies are made. But there's some really interesting details if you, get, if you look into it. And look, this is the only video I could find of this, and it's a little grotesque. But if you were to find a chrysalis and to open it up, boom, yes. And if you were to open up, 
within 24 hours of a caterpillar getting into a chrysalis, do you know what you'd find in there? Not a cozy caterpillar taking a nap in a sleeping bag. No, you'd find a big bag of goo. You would find a sack of snot-looking substance because when a caterpillar gets into a chrysalis within 24 hours, it completely dissolves. It loses all form, all shape. It just becomes goo. And it's not like caterpillars a while ago decided that they wanted to change how they made themselves. No, this is how it's always been. In fact, we have writings from scientists in the 1600s discussing this phenomenon. And at a time when like science and religion wasn't so far apart, the conversation went something like this. Look, there's an animal in our world that dies and then becomes a different animal. Is that what happens to us? Like when we die, do we become something different? And if we do, would we even remember what we were before? Not too long ago, some scientists from Georgetown University wanted to test this idea. So what they did is they took a group of caterpillars and they split them into two groups. And one group, they're like, be caterpillars and be merry. And the other group, they were like, we have plans for you. Right? So they took these caterpillars and they exposed them to a smell, a scent. A scent that caterpillars have no opinion about. But every time that they smelled this scent, they would give them an electronic zap. So smell, zap, smell, zap. To where the caterpillars hated the smell. And you know caterpillars hate something when they do this. So they hated the smell. And so it came time for them to make their chrysalises and they got in there. And so the big question was, would they, would they come out with this memory after this big transformational process? And so after a month, these caterpillars, they, they emerged and they were these beautiful, beautiful moths. And so they exposed them to this smell, this scent, and guess what? They hated the smell. And so the scientists knew. They knew that some part of its memory, some part of its consciousness was making it through that completely dissolving process. Another story, a, a Dutch biologist named Jean Schwarmadon in the 1700s gathered some colleagues together and he took a little tiny count, caterpillar and a little tiny scalpel and he made a little tiny incision because everything with caterpillars is little and tiny. And he gathered his colleagues and he said, hey, look, 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 right here, right here. Right underneath the surface of the caterpillar skin is the beginning stages of wings and the beginning stages of antenna. See, those wings and those antenna move to the sides of the chrysalis during the dissolving process. And they wait there until it's the right time to come back and complete the process. See, the story of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly is not the story of something dying and becoming something else. It's the story about it becoming what was always in there. So, so Joan's on her way down to this uh, march. And she gets down there, and she doesn't know a lot of people. She doesn't really know anybody. But then she sees some people that she knows from the hospital. because She works at this hospital, and a lot of the orderlies and, and nurses are African American. She sees a couple of people she knows, and she goes over. And she's like, hey, can I, can I be with you guys? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Joan told me she was like, look, I was, she was like, I was a very angry person in my early 20s. I was very angry. And I went to that march to... Uh, to defend these people. Like I was there for them, but I was there to defend them and I was there to protect them. And so she's like, I'm in this march. And she's like, you know, it's Tacoma. So when it started, it, you know, the, crowd, the march was going and the crowds are very small. But as we kept going closer and closer to downtown, the crowds got bigger and bigger. And she's like, at first the crowds were silent, but then there started to be some murmurs, and then some shoutings, and then some slurs. And eventually people were throwing things. And she's like, then they were throwing rocks. And she's like, I was seeing the people in this march getting hit by rocks. And she's like, and she's Irish Catholic, but she doesn't really believe in God. But she was like, I was praying. I was like, God, would you let a rock fall in front of me? I want a rock to be, I want to pick up a rock and I want to throw it back. Because that's what I thought we were here to do. And so sure enough, the Lord answered her call and this rock came down and landed right in front of her. And Joan picked went down, picked up the rock, and she looked back where it came from. She went to throw, and right then she felt the arm of the woman she was walking with go around her shoulder, and the other arm come around her body and stop her and hold her hand. And then this woman she was walking with whispered in her ear these words. She said, no, no, honey child, we do not throw rocks at our goals. We do not throw rocks at our goals. And Joan said that in this moment, it's like everything disappeared. 
She forgot that she was in a crowd. She forgot she was in Tacoma. She's like, it just went dark. And I saw before me two roads. And she's like, I saw the road that I was on. And it was a road filled with anger and violence and revenge and throwing rocks. She's like, but then in this moment, this other road opened up. And it looked like a road of peace and of kindness and of forgiveness and of love. And she's like, I had never really experienced love. And she's like, I dropped this rock and I let it fall to the ground. And in that moment, my heart broke open and I experienced love. Not like love is in like, you know, but love is in like the love behind the love, like the capital L love, like love, you know. And she's like, this woman, I dropped the rock and this woman kept her arm around me and we just continued to march. And she's like, that moment changed my life. I just told you a story of two women, one of, one of which a woman of, uh, a woman of color. And I understand that right now in the zeitgeist of our nation, uh, the last thing we need is a Caucasian mansplaining of, this, uh, of a historical events. I'm fully aware of that. And they're recording this, so it'll be on the YouTube forever. Um, but this story changed my life. And I don't really know any other story to really tell right now. And it changed my life for this reason. Like Joan told me the story in a a parking lot after an art show. And I burst into tears when I heard that line. Because what she told me and what happened in that story is one of the deepest, deepest truths about being a human being. About all of us together. And it's this. It's in every wisdom literature. It's in every religion. This is the thing. This is one of the golden nuggets. And it's this truth. That on the journey to becoming a whole person, you can view the other as in your way or you can view the other as part of the way. And this woman who was fighting for her own dignity, who was marching for her own equality, the conversation in their community was not can't wait to throw rocks at these people. It was like where we are going They have to be there too, even though they're throwing rocks now. Because where we're going is the place of togetherness. And so whatever Vancouver is becoming, as it keeps growing and all those things, there's probably a better catch line than what I can come up with. Maybe Vancouver, by the river. Or, uh, you know, Vancouver, we love bridges. Um, But (laughs) I think uh, I would submit to you that we could be Vancouver a city together, that whoever's going to come here and be a part of this community, that they're not in the way of becoming a great community, that they're actually the way to becoming a great community. Thanks.